A few years ago, I remembered very well the danger that attended my efforts to secure a few Navajo skulls for Professor Sir William Turner of the University of Edinburgh. It came to the ears of these Indians in the vicinity, and I was repeatedly cautioned not to make the attempt to carry out my designs. On another occasion, I was at the Navajo Agency, Fort Defiance, in northwestern New Mexico. And while there, I learned that some 50 or 60 of these Indians had been buried at different times, extending over many years, in a kind of cave up among the rocks of a neighboring canyon. I postponed my investigation of the place until daylight of the last day of my stay there, not breathing my plans to anyone in the interim. With a large bag rolled up under my arm and my ambulance awaiting my return at the entrance of the gorge, I climbed up to the place in a blinding snowstorm. Notwithstanding all my precautions, however, my reputation had gone ahead of me, and I found armed Indians posted in several localities, evidently there to resist my depredations at any hazard. They showed their agitation upon my approach, and I returned unsuccessful. Skulls of these Indians were nevertheless secured by me at a later date and are now in the Anatomical Museum at the Edinburgh University. It's like reading somebody's personal journal where he said, you know, they told me not to go, they said they were gonna shoot me, but I really, really needed these crania for science. So, I persevered in the name of science. And um, yeah, so that's what happens if you uh, do research on your own tribe. You find tons and tons of these sorts of um, ethnographic reports that um, wind up being uh, journal entries about grave robbing. How does it make you feel? Um, when I read these, I picture like my great-grandfather being one of the people who's armed at the top of a canyon. I picture it potentially being some family member whose grave has just been robbed. Who was this skull that he eventually got? Where did he get it from and where is it now? Did it get repatriated? Um, does the Navajo Nation know about this skull or many others that were collected by this anthropologist? Um, this is not in the United States, so the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act does not apply to this institution. So what are the methods of getting these ancestors returned? How easy is it? I don't know. But it makes me wonder where this person is today. And of course, there were lots of things that were done 100 or 200 years ago that with today's standards are considered unethical. But those people back then did not consider it unethical or it was even encouraged. Now, today you may view some of those regimes as being unethical or, or, or whatever, but back then that's how it worked. And so to say that I have to give back everything that is in our collections to a country of origin, to me, defeats the purpose of having a museum in the first place. So it is a very anthropocentric view, and sometimes I think people are very selfish about these things, that they don't want to share culture and history and biology with the rest of the world. We're all humans on this planet, and as far as I'm concerned, we're all not too different from each other. Yes, so my part of the collection of the Natural History Museum in, in Vienna is the international osteological collection. International means not Austrian. So we have about 6,500 uh, individuals here. This means that uh, we do have some 200, 200 skulls from the Americas, mainly Argentina and Peru. We have about 200 skulls, including New Zealand, Australia and Oceania. We have about um, 1,000 skulls from Africa, 
1,000 skulls from Asia and about 4,000 skulls from all over Europe, excluding Austria. Of those 6,500 6, skulls, we have uh, more or less 80% where we can have some kind, uh, more or less specific historical um, context, more or less specific. And, uh, and about 250 of those skulls are um, recent, that means from the 16th century on. We don't, we don't collect human remains anymore from international contexts. Uh, one, because uh, projects, international excavation projects are rare. Second, because political situations of those of countries where these excavations used to be are complex. And so we don't think that we are going to have in the next couple of years more um, human skulls coming in. I've been involved in repatriation issues in this country for many years now. And based upon my experiences with indigenous peoples from all over this country, I think that they would be outraged if they knew that uh, their ancestors were in foreign museums. That's the way they felt when they learned about uh, the uh, vast collections in this country that had Indian remains from all over. Uh, what is now the United States and also other parts of this hemisphere as well. At one time, there were more deceased Pawnees in museums than there were living Pawnees. Our population declined to nearly 600 people around 1900. And museums held well over 2,000 Pawnee remains in these institutions. And these remains made it to Europe. Um, so I'm just as appalled by Europeans doing this as I am by white Americans doing this. No respect for us as human beings. Ich schätze, hier sind äh, hunderte Schädel von Hereros und Namas in Deutschland äh, in verschiedene Universitäten oder Museen und äh, Das ist, was wir eigentlich äh, vermuten. Das war Widerstand, Widerstandkämpfer während der Völkermordprozess gegen die Heros und Namas. Für, für mich war das äh, keine Schädel, wie man so als Schädel, das war für mich Menschen, die hier nach Deutschland gebracht wurden oder einfach entführt wurden. Ja, das, äh, aus dem Kampf heraus und damit man hier Forschungen macht. Das war für uns traurig. Damals, als die Delegation hier war, die haben alle geweint. Die haben alle geweint, äh, solche äh, uns, äh, Landsleute in Kartons zu sehen. Das war für uns Landsleute, das, das war Widerstandkämpfer. So zu sehen, so verpackt zu sehen wie Schokoladen, das war einfach unmenschlich. Und ich sage immer noch, das ist unmenschlich und die haben hier nicht zu suchen. Die brauchen ihre Ruhe, die müssen ins Ruhe kommen. Das war, das war ein Lage weg. Von 1904 bis 2018, ein Lage weg. And with their colonization, our people um, have been traumatized in many ways. And so the taking of our ancestral remains is part of that trauma. Um, because um, Western science or Western academic tradition at that time from from the time of Captain Cook, positioned us as, um, as on the human hierarchy of lower than Europeans. Um, and so that made it possible for Western academics, Western scientists, medical institutions to take our ancestral remains and study them without our approval. In respect to the uh, Māori and Māori, Māori ancestral remains in um, Vienna, in the Natural History Museum in Vienna, um, we have a very good understanding of the ancestral remains there because in the late 1800s, a naturalist from, from Vienna or associated with Austria and Germany, um, Mr. Reichek, Andreas Reichek, came to New Zealand. And during his activities in New Zealand, he recorded his, um, 
his pilfering, um, taking ancestral remains without the um, approval of um, Māori. And um, so he recorded all this. It's written in quite a number of books that he's um, that have been published about him. And so it's general knowledge in New Zealand that um, this um, collector, or you could say thief, um, stole our ancestral remains and took them to collections overseas. So, um, yes, we've got a very good knowledge and understanding of how these ancestors, who collected them, how they were taken, and where they are. Human remains coming in our department for investigations are sometimes asked to be put back to their um, local um, institution. It could be that the church uh, builds a new um, pavement, they find the skeletons, they want to have it investigated, but after this, they want to have them back. This is a normal topic for us to give skeletons after scientific investigations back to the community. The special requests you're talking about is um, requests from uh, native tribes from different countries um, for old or in 200, 200 years ago collected skulls. This uh, is a little bit more difficult and it is more political than if a local community gives us something for research and wants it back. Um, as this, we are not the acting persons in the beginning. We did not collect them. It was a long time ago. We don't know the connections anymore. So a lot of historical uh, provenance um, research has to be done in the forefront. And the whole thing has to go over a political um, interaction. When we approach museums, for the first time or even subsequent times about collections that hold our ancestors. And this happened here in the United States and the same happens in Europe. Uh, we, met, we meet resistance, sometimes fierce resistance, because these museums and these other entities that hold the remains of our ancestors do not understand that these individuals are our relatives and that they represent us to the past. And uh, another problem is that these people who are in museums, the curators and others, the anthropologists and the archeologists who um, study those remains have established reputations, careers, livelihoods, and futures based upon the exploitation of our dead. They will not give us truthful information about what's in our collections. Um, when we do uh, uh, carry on dialogue with them, they often will not respond unless they're asked the right question, meaning they do not volunteer uh, information that will help with repatriation. They stonewall, uh, they're deceitful, and um, they're trying to maintain a racist status quo. I don't think we have an official position. We just take every case by its own merit. And first of all, of course, if it turns out that something has been stolen, something has been obtained uh, in an illegal way, and I should specify that it was illegal at the time, because only then can it be considered illegal, because to do things to change laws retroactively, I don't think is a very good way to have a, a legal state. In the same way, I cannot just because, let's say, some people from, from, from another country come and say, hey, these are my ancestors and I want them back, I cannot say, oh, sure, yeah, here you have the bone, yeah? No, no, no. There has to be a, a perfect legal case that has to be made, and then it has to go through the proper channels through the government here, so that it has to go through uh, probably the embassy of a, very, of a country that then makes an official request to the Minister of Culture, who is responsible ultimately for the collections that belong to the Republic of Austria. 
Natürlich, am Anfang war auch sehr schwierig, das zu thematisieren, weil die Institutionen oder die Museen oder die Direktoren von Museen haben das einfach gelogen. Es gab eine Delegation aus 2015 aus den USA, Diaspora aus den USA. Wir wollen unbedingt Shuttle, also diese Shuttle auch mal ansehen. Die wollen uns auch nicht erlauben, diese Sandschädel so anzuschauen. Die haben, die haben geweigert, weil die haben, der Grund war, angeblich, weil wir keine Wissenschaftler sind. Aber wir, sind, wir haben gesagt, wir sind aber Angehörige dieser Menschen und wir wollen das unbedingt sehen. Die acht Inuit, die in Europa starben, fünf von ihnen, ihre Remains sind are preserved in Paris, but there is one, a little three-year-old, her skull is in Berlin. And this is the only museum so far who has not authorized me to go in and see the remains. So they have informed me of what they, they do own, but we haven't been authorized to go in. But in Paris, they welcomed Uh, Johannes and myself, every time I've been there, always with open arms. They've always they've been very transparent, telling us everything and even more. Well, the question of, of, of open access and digitalization and things like this is a very complex one because it is not cheap to do these things. And our intent usually is when we do digitalization that the public sees is to do something uh, where we kind of put out teasers or, or examples of what we have in our collections. Now, for scientific research, you know, it's, it's always the question, cui bono? So who, who benefits? So what do you, who do you do something for? You know, researchers can always come, they're always welcome, this is part of our duty. So people can come and work with the collections. I am reluctant to put things out in the wide internet, you know, we know the internet is a strange place. So we decided to be proactive rather than reactive because we're aware that most institutions are reactive. They have their collections, but then they don't reach out to Indigenous people to tell them about it. Our collection wasn't known about, so nobody would have ever contacted us in the first place. So we decided to be proactive because that was the morally right thing to do. One of the duties we have in medicine is called the duty of candour. So the duty of candour is to be truthful and open um, about difficult situations, difficult circumstances where we've made a mistake or something's gone wrong and we're embarrassed by it. We can't hide behind that and say, well, we, we hope nobody's going to ask. We've got a duty to be open and honest about things, even though they're difficult to be open and honest about. If there is a request for repatriation, uh, I think this has to be treated in a very respectful way, first of all. And I think that in doing so, and this respect being mutual, it is possible, and in my opinion, it, it's desirable, to have some kind of um, enriching collaboration of all the people involved in this question. So I think that uh, in this mutual and respectful way of collaborating with the communities who, re who do the requests for repatriation, it would be interesting to, to accept research on those remains to see how anthropological expertise can help to reconstruct the story of these individuals so that they can again be persons and then to repatriate. I think this, this would be uh, an interesting way of, of, of trying to apologize for the errors done in the past by different people. So sometimes scientists will engage in repatriation, but only when they've been allowed to do their science 
only when the some data has been gathered, which generally is things like genetic material being taken from the teeth of the ancestors or the skin of the ancestors. And after all of that's happened, then the Indigenous people can have their remains returned. Well, I, I, so I don't think that that is the highest standards of ethics. That's like me saying, I'll only operate on a patient once they've consented to take part in my research. That's, um, a, it's not true consent. It's not true informed consent. That is manipulating the situation so that I get something out of it that I want. Um, I think research, um, the principle of undertaking research on our ancestral remains um, is actually quite a big question because there's different types of research that can be undertaken on ancestral remains. Some of them can be scientific research such as DNA testing, um, carbon dating, um, and that is quite intrusive research. So that takes a bit of the ancestor and destroys it. We totally support provenance research that isn't intrusive or takes a bit of our ancestor away from, you know, from us. At the end of the day, these ancestors were um, living human beings, just like us. And so the ownership, there is no ownership of them. So even though they may be overseas, I don't believe the overseas institutions own them. They still have a, a cultural connection, a physical connection, an ancestral connection with, the, with their communities of origin. And so my focus would be around what do the communities of origin, are they seeking their return? Are they agreeing to any other type of intrusive research? At the end of the day, it, it should be around returning the ancestors to where they come from so they may be comforted by their communities of origin. If the director would ask me about the repatriation of the Maori human remains, um, I would like to ask him to have time, and maybe this time is going to be sufficient until this question arrives, because we have already started doing our research. This research is twofold. One to see the provenance, and there is another thing we agreed upon, as far as I understood, that we could do uh, bioarchaeological research on the human remains themselves. If there is a political will to give them away, okay, we do our research, we make the best documentation as possible, and we would give them away. As I'm a curator, my job is to take care of this and to care for them. As a scientist, I a pure scientist, I would say keep them because um, or the best deal is to give it into a museum, a local museum or that the science uh, do, does not um, lose the possibility to investigate in them. So I don't mind giving them back if they are accessible in, in asking these tribes uh, for special issues, for special scientific questions. If I just give them away and they are reburied, they are lost for science. It's much more difficult to work through issues of repatriation or personhood in a collection that still sees remains as scientific material and still feels itself to be studying the remains. In fact, very few of these remains ever actually are studied. There are huge benefits to working with communities of origin on research. Communities of origin come up with really interesting research questions. There have been some great examples of glacier bodies, for instance, including you know, the well-known European Iceman, but also similar examples in northern British Columbia where the community of origin has set the research agenda, has asked really interesting research questions that often think outside the box of existing scientific frameworks. I guess the other thing is to turn the question around and ask why you would want to do research on collections in an unethical way. And basically what I hear is a lot of scientists wanting to retain collections in a way that privileges science 
and disempowers communities of origin, particularly indigenous communities. And I'm sorry, but that simply maintains colonial relations of power. For me, it's really important to, to understand that there is a healing process to be made. And some people need to, to be healed. And some people need to, to heal also. And as I said, if we are putting the things right, they have to be. So maybe after that, we will be ba able to balance relationships. And that's not only the work of indigenous peoples to heal themselves, but we need help. That's only something about respect and dignity. If my community has been mistreated for so many hundreds of years, has been all of the men were taken out and shot, there was diseases passed to us which devastated our communities, and then even in contemporary times, I'm told that I'm not as good as other citizens, my language doesn't matter, my traditions don't matter. Then to be reunited with somebody that lived before those times is a very powerful thing. But also to be respected, to be valued in such a way that your ancestors matter and the university is going to pay because we truly believe that they matter. That produces emotion as well, that for many people, this was the first time they'd ever been shown any respect by somebody outside of their own community. And it's also bringing back to them the treasures that those ancestors held, the treasures of their tradition, their languages, their customs, their spirituality, all of that comes and is united at that moment when they're reburied. If, if the only time that we can get emotional is when a member of our own family is affected, then that doesn't really say very much about our capacity as human beings. We need to be emotionally engaged with history. And he's in a part of the cemetery that they have repatriated and reburied many ancestors. So each grave has a cross that says repatriated from this museum. Uh, beloved ancestor of Haida Gwaii, you know, forever to remain at home. And we were all standing around and people were putting offerings of tobacco and other medicine plants into the grave. And I thought, well, I was the one who have, has worked with Haida people all this, all this time. I was the one who wrote the case to present to the committees at the university that he should be repatriated. I was the one to work with the Haida to arrange the handover ceremony. Don't stop now. Um, so I asked one of the men who was finishing the process if it would be appropriate for me actually to pick up the shovel and help to bury him. And he had this big grin. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I picked up the shovel and I buried him. We're not just around to sign paper, you know, we're not just around to hand you a package and let you take it away. If we're doing this, it's because we want to have a positive relationship with you in the future and and we mean it and as a curator yes it felt a bit odd to be burying something that had been part of the collection I was responsible for but it also felt absolutely right it felt very uh, productive it felt like that wasn't the end of things it felt like this relationship had a future and that we were in this together.